We are back from the break and ready for the next panel discussion, which will look at technological innovation and systemic risk. Financial innovation, of course, can be beneficial to customers and increase competition in the financial system, but it also brings challenges. The chair of this panel is Cecilia Skingsley, and uh, she will introduce the, uh, the, the members of the panel and she will lead the discussion. So over to you, Ms. Skingsley. Thank you very much, Connie, and hello to you all. Uh, it's my utmost pleasure to chair this panel uh, today on discussing how technological innovation is reshaping systemic risks. Uh, I have a very distinguished group of fellow panelists here to discuss the issue. And before I introduce them, uh, I'd just like to give a couple of remarks, taking advantage of the fact that I'm chairing this particularly interesting and fascinating subject. Um, so I'd like to start with something that might be sounding like a cliche, but let me allow, allow myself to uh, um, evaluate and, and deliberately um, a little bit on it. So we are in an era of big technological transitions in the financial sector, and the financial industry is experimenting uh, how to use different new innovations. We often think about this, that this is mostly about crypto assets, stable coins, but also unbanked cryptos uh, that are being developed and also taken up and used by our populations. But there is also other uh, things going on, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And last but not least, great many central banks are actively considering different kinds of upgradings of their payment systems and also exploring the possibilities of issuing central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. And there is a clear a lot of excitement about how technological innovation can shape the financial sector. Um, there are those who says that technology will make a quantum leap in the way financial services are provided uh, with the hope that this will make them more efficient and more accessible. And the hard work here really is to make the right calls into what could be fundamental changes and what is more smoke and mirrors. Um, but like every kind of transition we have seen through the history, also this wave of transition, technological transition, comes with sort of two phases in the same sense that the, uh, the Greek and the Roman mythology of god of transitions, namely Janus, uh, was depicted with two phases. Uh, in this regard, the first phase is the one where um, we can see improvements in efficiency and effectiveness of the financial sector. And me representing the uh, BIS Innovation Hub uh, are exactly focused on the possible, possible benefits that technological innovation can actually bring to the financial sector. So at the Hub, we conduct a number of practical experiments uh, on how these new technologies could possibly be applied to develop public goods geared to improving the global financial systems in the world. Uh, for one example, uh, we conduct and are conducting a number of projects to improve the current payment systems and more importantly how different versions of CBDCs could be used to enhance cross-border payments but also retail payments. We all also have projects in the area of subtech where we test how new technologies such as AI and machine learning can help supervisors do their job in a more efficient way. But uh, at the same time, there is also the second phase of this great technological transition, uh, which is the one where new uh, interconnections, new concentration of exposures and potentially new risks brings nasty surprises to us all as regulators, policymakers and supervisors. So it is important that authorities, academia and key financial players continue to devote and expand collective thinking on which new systemic risks could emerge from the ongoing technological transformation and more also importantly how to mitigate those. Ultimately the lessons we learned from the 2008 great financial crisis and global financial crisis is a reminder that we should not allow imbalances to grow and explode in new areas that we do not understand sufficiently yet. So, and at the BIS Innovation Hub, we are contributing to the best of our ability to develop practical tools to monitor these new developments. In, I can take, for example, the crypto markets. 
one of our projects at the Eurosystem Center is developing an open source market intelligence platform to shed light on uh, in the crypto space on market capitalizations, economic activities, and hence the risks to financial stability. But beyond practical tools, it is also important that we collectively ask ourselves a number of questions. And here I'd like to raise three of those. Number one is, are we properly understanding the systemic implications that technological innovation is having in the financial system? Um, important question number two for uh, the ESRB goes, uh, are, are microprudential tools appropriate to capture and address these new systemic risks? And if they are not, uh, in what way should these macro prudential tools be expanded? And number three, the current macro prudential regulation, are they fit for purpose when uh, this technological transformation occurs? Uh, setting the stage, uh, now uh, it is my, um, my great uh, pr uh, pride to introduce uh, the views uh, of, of, uh, of these issues from our panelists. And let me uh, introduce our four panelists. We will start with Xavier Vives. Xavier is the Professor of Economics and Financial Management and directing, Director of the Banking Initiative at the IESE Business School of the University of Navarra in Spain. Professor Vives has conducted research work on the disruptions of digital innovations in banking and in the broader financial system. Um, Xavier will be followed by Michael Leibrook, Managing Director at the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. And Michael has a pivotal role in DTCC's thinking on systemic risk. And DTCC is actively working on experimenting new technologies in the settlement and clearing space. Uh, with a project of DLT-based infrastructure looking into the possibilities of book and settle equities transactions using this technology. Uh, Michael will be followed by Nelly Lang, Undersecretary for Domestic Finance of the U.S. Treasury Department. And the U.S. Treasury works extensively on a number of areas related to the benefits but also the risks of digital assets as has been mandate by, mandated by President Joe Biden's executive order on digital assets. And our fourth panelist is Andrea Mechler, member of the governing board of the Swiss National Bank. And I'm particularly happy to have Andrea and the uh, um, Swiss National Bank uh, on this panel, since uh, Switzerland and that institution takes a number of important, interesting steps embedding digital assets and DLT-based infrastructures into its framework and, and, um, and developing uh, with, a, with, a, with a very optimistic view of what these new technologies can do. And it's an it's a important supporter as well at, with the BIS Innovation Hub. So we will start with Xavier Vives. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, share the slides. Yes. OK, thank you very much. So I'm very pleased uh, to be here. So thank you very much for the invitation at this uh, conference. Um, I would like to talk basically about markets and uh, banks and intermediation. So stability issues uh, first in markets and then briefly also in, in banks and intermediaries, in particular uh, in respect to the competition uh, of fintechs or the fintech entry into the lending uh, markets. Uh, so the, the, the first topic uh, is about the impact of electronification, in particular automation also, and the market structural change in both um, equity and bond markets, and how it relates uh, to the drivers of market fragility. So let me motivate um, uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, with flash events. Uh, those are those episodes of sudden liquidity dry drops with large price movements that quickly uh, reverse. And we've had them everywhere in foreign exchange, sterling dollar, euro Swiss franc, uh, in uh, bonds like the 10-year U.S. Treasury uh, yield uh, rally in 2014, 
uh, or in uh, equities like uh, the ETF episode in 2010 and, and quite a few uh, others. Uh, more uh, specifically, let me talk a little bit more about uh, uh, the US uh, Treasury market or, or treasuries, uh, because uh, lately there has been more talk about uh, liquidity issues uh, in this extremely uh, important market. Uh, so there was a, a, a flash event um, uh, in 15 October in 2014, uh, which is uh, depicted here in the green with the green line. Um, uh, on this axis, we have debt. OK, and here time. And so uh, the, the blue one is one on uh, 17 uh, September, uh, which in fact was due to some news. Uh, there was a, a dip in the depth uh, of the market and then a quick recovery. Uh, while in the um, 15 uh, of October, uh, debt kept declining uh, for quite a while and, and uh, debt issues uh, were not so easily resolved, although they were uh, resolved um, eventually. Um, in fact, quite a few of these uh, events, in particular in equity markets, are with no news or with no apparent news. Okay, so it's really are purely internal market uh, dynamics. Uh, back to treasuries. Uh, so this I took from the Financial Times uh, recently. No, they were mentioning an article that it has become harder. Uh, somehow to trade uh, in treasuries because liquidity has deteriorated. Uh, uh, this again is market debt, and we see some uh, what with oscillations, what a downward trend uh, since 2013 uh, or so. And this is in a market obviously that has become vastly uh, larger and important. So the, the issue uh, is important. Uh, the financial stability report of the uh, Fed of the November. Uh, 2022 uh, mentions two points which I think are, um, are important and related uh, to the issue uh, we're talking about. The first, uh, it is stated, the continued uh, low level of market debt means that liquidity remains more sensitive to the actions of liquidity providers that use high frequency trading strategies to replenish the order book rapidly. That's one statement. And the other important statement is that greater concentration of liquidity provision among firms that may follow similar strategies, correlated strategies, can be a source of fragility, making it more likely that liquidity could further deteriorate sharply in response to future shocks. And then from the point of view of the participants, so here we have Greg Peters uh, from a fixed income uh, company, uh, is basically seen that uh, in this expression, I would say, no, the odds of a financial accident are just higher. So a market is fragile when um, a small change in a parameter, in a market parameter, uh, provokes um, large effects, and this is the accident. What's behind this? Uh, well, uh, now for a while, we'll have a change in market structure. The trading floor, uh, you see, goes from our, uh, no, the, the old uh, trading floor, for example, uh, in equities, uh, where the liquidity was supplied by professional agents, so they were agents in charge of keeping the market stable, let's say, uh, to the modern uh, with electronification and the limit order book, uh, now, so this is, for example, no, how it looks for Apple, uh, there is all to all uh, trading. So that's to say there are no specific agents in charge of maintaining uh, the market stable. What are the consequences? Uh, well, first, the first consequence is that market information is vital to trade and also to provide liquidity. And in general, despite that there are more potential liquidity suppliers and there is more information provision, there are two uh, important frictions. The first is that the participation of some liquidity suppliers is variable. So it's not continuous. They are not continuously present in the market. And even uh, some have retrenched, like maybe banks for regulatory reasons. Others, maybe for technical reasons, are not continuously present. That's the first. Friction. The second is a, an information friction. There are frictions in market information, which limits some traders' access to reliable and timely market information. What's the result? The result is that modern markets have improved liquidity and welfare on average. I think there is uh, no question about that, but at the potential cost of increased fragility in the sense, in the specific sense, that the small changes in market parameters may have large effects in liquidity. What's the mechanism behind this, um, uh, uh, this fragility? 
So according to some research uh, I am conducting uh, with Giovanni Cespa uh, of, of Bayes Business School uh, now, and in fact in theoretical models, well, we are after the, 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 the theoretical mechanism that may be behind this, we see the following, that market opacity is crucial. So market opacity uh, may prevent the participation of non-standard liquidity providers in the market and impair the risk-bearing capacity of the same market. And in fact, then there is a feedback loop where a drop in liquidity may increase the demand for liquidity because of the increase basically in volatility of returns that it induces and generates a further drop in liquidity, making liquidity fragile. When does this happen? This happens when the risk bearing capacity of the market is insufficient to absorb the hedging needs of the traders. For example, liquidity demand is strong, the volatility of the payoff is large, traders or market makers uh, have higher risk aversion. And you see that uh, there are certain circumstances where all these uh, are, I mean, move together, basically. And then, furthermore, fragility is aggravated by the withdrawal of market makers. So, that's to say, some uh, um, traders that, that make the market, basically, that sometimes, uh, for different reasons, maybe for technical reasons, uh, or for uh, risk control reasons, they withdraw from the market. What's the consequence? Well, the consequence is that the policy to foster risk sharing, market stability and improve welfare uh, is or has to be first to improve disclosure and transparency, to make available reliable market information. So this I know that in the in the US, as also as Nelly uh, pointed out uh, uh, to me, uh, there is um, there are there are taking steps in the US. Steps uh, uh, steps are being uh, taken to improve uh, disclosure and transparency in the treasury market. And in Europe, uh, we would benefit, I think, and in the equity markets uh, from a consolidated tape, something that there is in the US, but um, it's not uh, there uh, in Europe. So this would be a recommendation uh, for Europe. Furthermore. Uh, uh, measures that foster the continuous dealer participation in the market also would help. We have to, there is a caveat though, that even um, disclosure of transparency or this continuous dealer participation typically does not have linear effects, but sometimes there are non-linear effects that one has to be uh, careful. And at this point, I don't have more time to elaborate on this, but it's something that has to be taken into account. Okay, second uh, topic uh, that I want to uh, mention briefly. Uh, and the second topic is on the impact of fintech. So basically information technology you now applied to finance in lending markets. And in particular, I'm thinking more for small and medium sized firms. What are the consequences for investment, bank stability and overall uh, welfare of market participants? So just a, a couple of slides to uh, remind ourselves uh, that the growth uh, of uh, fintech and big tech credit uh, is relevant. Um, uh, fintech credit is growing in Europe and uh, big tech credit more uh, is booming more in Asia, but in both uh, uh, it's growing. So this is uh, from a study from the BIS is somewhat uh, dated still, but still we, we see uh, the trends, for example, in Europe uh, for um, for fintech and in Asia for um, for big tech. And more specifically, uh, let me just uh, take uh, just one example of my bank, which uh, of the Ant Financial Group. So you see here uh, how the uh, extremely fast, uh, uh, I would say, exponential growth of individual micro small business lending lending uh, from. Uh, this uh, uh, type of uh, technologically uh, advanced uh, bank. And uh, as you may know, so behind this, uh, there is this substitution of collateral for information. So this uh, very small business cannot post collateral, but they can provide information uh, through uh, their, um, their all the devices that are connected and that uh, the AND platform uh, may, uh, may control. So the question is, to what extent does the emergence of fintech uh, makes banking more contestable, more competitive, more or less stable, or better or worse aligned with social welfare? No? So these are the big, 
questions. And then some uh, some partial answers, and uh, again based on theoretical models, uh, which I'm working with uh, Ziki and Ye, also from ESC Business School, uh, on lending markets. So what we find, uh, this has all, all these findings have empirical support. In fact, if an intermediary adopts more advanced information technology, then it can charge higher loan rates and is more stable because it has more skin in the game to monitor the loans um, of the uh, of the borrowers. So, in fact, there is evidence uh, that uh, banks that were more advanced technologically in the global financial crisis uh, fare better uh, in terms of uh, default, uh, in, in terms of um, avoiding defaults uh, from loans. However, and this is an important proviso, the impact of an overall adoption of information technology here on, on lending depends on its type. And here I would like to um, distinguish between two types of information uh, improvements uh, in, in IT, information technology, that benefit the monitoring of these uh, financial intermediaries, type one and type two. Type one is a general um, improvement in processing information due to our uh, to machine learning techniques, the advances in cloud uh, computing and storage, information management software. Uh, this is a, a type of, um, uh, of improvement in, uh, of in processing information, uh, which really reduces costs and really does not change much the competitive position of banks as long as it is a general improvement and it betters bank stability. The second is this type of uh, improvement uh, in information technology that decreases the distance between the borrower and the lender. For example, in terms of physical uh, or physical distance uh, friction, because of the diffusion of video conferencing, now what we're doing now, the smartphone, mobile apps, etc., or or decreasing the distance between the lender and the, uh, and the borrower in terms of expertise, for example, in terms of the expertise of the uh, lender in terms of the industry. So uh, these are uh, uh, different types uh, of, um, of information technology, uh, which if they are type two, they change the differentiation between banks. And therefore, uh, they change the degree of competitive pressure in the market. And this may be good if competitive pressure is insufficient, but it may be bad if already we are in a situation which is quite competitive and uh, which reduces uh, margins so much that banks lose the skin in the game or intermediaries lose the skin in the game and then monitor uh, less and then defaults uh, would uh, go. In any case, also what we find is that any type of information technology improvement is good for welfare when it extends the market, basically when it covers market segments that previously were not covered. This basically, it improves financial inclusion. Okay, finally, and with this, I, I will end. More specifically, what could be the effects of the entry of fintechs in the lending market? And here, uh, we have to distinguish uh, quite carefully uh, on whether banks have the same ability to price flexibly and to price discriminate than fintechs or not. If they do not, if they are more rigid in, in pricing because of historical reasons, because of regulation, because of they are in, on, incapable uh, technologically, because they depend less on the cloud and more on the mainframe, uh, then we find the following, that a fintech can penetrate the lending market even with no advantage in monitoring efficiency or funding costs, just because it can price more efficiently, or more efficiently from the private point of view, obviously. For entrepreneurs then of the same characteristics, banks' monitor effort is higher than the one on fintechs, and in fact, fintech borrowers are more likely to default, and this also has empirical support. Furthermore, fintech entry may decrease um, investment, basically entrepreneurs' investment, if the competition within fintechs is not sufficiently intense. Okay, otherwise it does. It, it, it's good for investment. However, all these things do not happen if banks can price as flexible as fintechs. Then fintech entry happens only if they have better efficiency or funding cost. So a policy recommendation here is uh, not to put obstacles uh, to banks 
uh, in, uh, in pricing with further regulations. So here, uh, a level playing field uh, would help. Uh, two last points. Uh, FinTech entry also can induce, and in fact, we have seen that, bank exit of restructuring, uh, apart also because there, there was, an, in fact, in Europe in particular, quite a bit of excess capacity in, in, the, uh, in the bank uh, branch networks. And this potentially reduces the intensity of lending competition and may hurt investment, so depending on the, on the circumstances. Uh, however, again, FinTech entry will be unambiguously good when it extends the market to unserved consumers and increases uh, financial inclusion. Thank you very much. Uh, I am uh, done with this. Uh, in the slides, then, you'll find references and also references to report which relates to what I've uh, talked about and you will have available. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Vivas. Uh, I would now like to introduce you to you Michael Leibrook, Managing Director at the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. Michael, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you to the ESRB for the opportunity to speak at today's event. As brief background on DTCC, we're a member-owned and governed financial market utility. Our core clearing and settlement activities are comprised of three systemically important FMUs that cover U.S. equity products, U.S. government and mortgage-backed securities, and DTC, our securities depository. We also maintain global trade repositories worldwide. While my role at DTCC is to identify and monitor potential systemic risks, I'll begin my remarks today by talking about the substantial current and future benefits of technology innovation. If you can move to the first slide, please. There we go. OK, okay. great. <laughs> As you can see from the slide, emerging technologies hold considerable promise and benefits for the financial system. A couple of examples. Distributed ledgers can be used to validate and track transactions on a distributed and decentralized platform, providing a resilient and cost-effective alternative to today's centralized payment infrastructures. The payment arena is also a great example of how technology has helped increase overall customer access. Instead of utilizing banking relationships or credit card providers for payments, Consumers now routinely use tools like Venmo, PayPal, etc. Blockchain, meanwhile, can improve efficiency in international payments versus current payment systems and infrastructures. Also, there's potential for real-time trade settlement, not available today, which will help capital efficiency and reduce risk. So it's clear that new technologies are changing the way society and our industry conducts business in a meaningful way. What I see as a changing paradigm in this space is the way in which technology is having an impact. For example, initial fintech developments are focused mainly on enhancing existing capabilities, while future applications will likely transform the way counterparties interact with one another. We can move to the next slide, please. Great. In terms of some guiding principles, I feel any development of digital asset solutions has to begin with a strong client and industry-centric approach. Solutions should allow the industry to optimize the full value chain or key components of it to achieve cost and operational efficiency. Importantly, however, any new technology initiative should provide equal or greater resilience than existing infrastructures and solutions. These principles will help ensure that technology developments are designed to provide optimal benefits to the industry while keeping a close eye on risk and resilience. Next slide, please. When I look back at DTC's role in emerging technologies, I remember the 2016 paper we published called Embracing Disruption, Tapping the Potential for Distributed Ledger. I think the title of that paper, Embracing Disruption, is very appropriate, not just to describe DTC's mindset, but also for today's discussion. As you can see from this list of initiatives, the company's had a history of exploring and testing emerging technologies to reduce risk and cost in the post-trade space. Starting in 2016, DTC replatformed its trade information warehouse for credit derivatives using cloud and DLT. In 2020, we explored asset tokenization and digital infrastructure prototypes to support private market security issuance, transfer, and servicing, which can improve liquidity and make settlement more efficient. And more recently, Project Lithium, now known as Security Settlement Pilot, is a prototype to explore how a U.S. central bank digital currency might operate in the U.S. clearing and settlement infrastructure, leveraging DLT. 
next slide. Now that I've discussed some of the potential benefits of digital assets and some ongoing use cases in the US, I'll turn my attention to some of the potential threats I see from these technologies. First and foremost, interdependency or interconnectedness risk. Recent events at FTX, Gemini, and other crypto platforms highlight the increased risk of contagion to the financial sector and real economy. Correlations between crypto asset prices and mainstream equity indices have been steadily increasing according to a recent FSB report. Meanwhile, use of DLT, while minimizing some risks and providing efficiencies, also increases the number of points of potential failure, as well as the risk of data breaches, hacking, and other types of third-party risk. In terms of models, traditional models that leverage historical data can be inconsistent when predicting forward-looking outcomes. Over-reliance on high-speed processing and algo decision-making can lead to errors, lack transparency, and include unintended biases. In terms of conflicting national priorities, this could also be an impediment to effectively thwarting cyber terrorism, financial crimes, both of which are on the rise. And finally, the use of social media platforms like Twitter, online forums like Reddit, have the potential to impact market volatility and risk. Also, low-cost digital platforms and brokerages have made retail financial participation largely frictionless, but the meme stock event is evidence of the potential for significant downside risk. I should note, this is just a partial list of risks given the time available. A few additional areas of concern I'll briefly mention include fraud and conduct risk. According to a recent U.S. Treasury report, the U.S. FTC logged almost 50,000 reported incidents of crypto-related fraud between January 21 and March 22 for a value of more than a billion dollars. Asset bubble and volatility risk, as we've seen, occur in multiple time periods. Operational risk, especially due to the untested track record of many new entrants in the space. And the lack of a centralized organization as a governing oversight authority for certain technologies. Now, some common mitigants across many of these risks include incorporating an interconnectedness risk management approach into traditional ERM frameworks, which is something DTC has done, a heightened focus on resilience and third party risk, enhanced focus on model risk management, and increased industry collaboration on emerging and non traditional risks, to name a few. If we move to the last slide, please. Since I'm speaking mainly from the perspective of a US CCP, I thought I'd share some highlights about what I see as key developments in the US legislative and regulatory agenda. The key recent development was the White House executive order in March 22. Priorities of this order include a focus on consumer and investor protection, financial stability, and the role of the U.S. in the global financial system. In line with the executive order, the Treasury's issued multiple reports, including implications for consumers, investors, and businesses, which outline implications of developments and adoption of crypto assets. Also, as you can see here, there are in-flight congressional proposals regarding digital asset spot market and stable coins, given the increased focus in these areas. Finally, in October of this year, FSOC released its Digital Asset Financial Stability Risk and Regulation Report as part of the Digital Asset Executive Order. The report focused on crypto asset risks and outlined regulatory gaps and market risks that could pose threats to stability. Given some significant risk events in the crypto markets of late, we expect legislative activity to accelerate next year when the new Congress is seated. To summarize, in my remarks today, I covered what I see as the many potential benefits brought by emerging technologies. I mentioned how these can lead to greater access to products and services, along with lower costs and efficiencies for consumers and institutions. However, to date, I suggest that many of these benefits have yet to be fully realized, despite the great promise. At the same time, we've already seen some significant unexpected risks materialize through dislocation in crypto prices, consumer claims of fraud, and a major failure of a crypto exchange. Therefore, I believe this evidence to date indicates that the balance between prudent innovation and systemic risk considerations hasn't yet been achieved. Policymakers and regulators should act swiftly to ensure we have the appropriate guardrails and best practices in place globally, and to ensure that any new technology initiative provide equal or greater resilience than existing infrastructures. At all costs, we should avoid a scenario whereby, in the pursuit of rapid innovation, 
and the desire for speed and convenience, we don't allow systemic risk to develop after so much progress has been made since the last financial crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. I uh, think the last slide was a very uh, elegant um, uh, connection to our next panelist, which is Nelly Lang at the U.S. Treasury Department. Nelly is the Undersecretary for Domestic Finance, and it's a real honor to have you on this panel, giving you uh, the U.S. Treasury perspective. So, Nelly, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Cecilia, and thank you to the ESRB for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's an honor to be here. Um, I have some slides, if we could put them up, please. So following Michael today, I thought I would focus on some of these digital asset reports that he referred to. Um, so I'm going to focus specifically on investor protection and then systemic risk. So next slide, please. Um, just the background, President Biden's executive order issued in March 2022 to ensure the responsible development of digital assets was designed to establish a government-wide approach to address the risks and harness the potential benefits of digital assets and their underlying technology. Uh, Treasury led a number of reports, and I'm just listing some of them here. One is the future of money and payments. Um, a second, implications of crypto assets for consumers, investors, and businesses. Third, issues for finance and national security. And then fourth, international engagement and cooperation. Treasury also chairs the Financial Stability Oversight Council and issued a report on financial stability risks and regulatory gaps. And as I said today, I'm going to just get a little bit deeper into the investor and consumer protection issues and then the systemic risk considerations. Um, before I dig in and just into the detail, let me just mention a few of the main points I do want to make. Um, so new innovations as part of this theme of this panel, I believe are potentially transformational, but there are clear and present risks. Um, these new innovations pose these risks, but I think actually the risks are quite similar and the channels for systemic risk are familiar to us. They are not so unique. Um, we have consumer and investor protection laws for market integrity. We have enforcement authorities. I think we are have learned, however, they are not sufficient to address the types of risks that are common to financial activities that crypto pose. And we will need legislation. And the reports do propose various specific um, pr proposals for legislation. So let me just turn to the first. Uh, this report is the one on consumer um, and investor uh, protections and the implications of crypto. The charge in this report was what are the current use cases for crypto assets and are vulnerable communities uh, disparately impacted? Um, the main findings of the report were that there are high frequent high frequency of operational failures, market manipulation, fraud, thefts, and scams. I think we all saw the the market value of crypto assets go up and go down, and there's thousands and thousands of digital crypto assets that um, have questionable value. Um, consumers and investors were exposed to improper conduct. Uh, lack of transparency, non-compliance with existing regulations, including misrepresentation of the availability of deposit insurance, for example. And we did find that vulnerable populations, such as the elderly or some uh, low-income populations, were targeted, um, but I think systemic systematic data are inadequate to make a the recommendations from this report related to consumer and investor protection were for the regulators to continue to aggressively pursue enforcement, to continue to issue guidance and rules where needed, and to work together in a more coordinated way to provide consistent and comprehensive oversight. 
for those of you not familiar with the U.S., we have federal and we have a lot of state regulators um, who are involved in the crypto asset regulatory uh, arena. And then there was um, an explicit recommendation to provide better information to consumers. If you go to the next slide, please. The financial stability uh, risks of digital assets was written by the Financial Stability Oversight Council and builds on this earlier, this previous report. The charge of this report was, what are the financial stability risks and are there regulatory gaps for digital assets? And then to make explicit recommendations for how to mitigate systemic risks. Uh, the main findings to summarize, um, a broad conclusion was financial stability risk could emerge if crypto assets increased in scale or the interconnections with the traditional financial system were to deepen and when activities were not appropriately regulated and rules are not enforced. A um, lot of words negotiated here, um, but despite the rise in market value, the activities were fairly limited in size their connections with the banking sector and other uh, traditional financial parts of the system that are highly levered uh, were still also limited. Uh, but it allows for if the activities are appropriately regulated and rules are enforced, it's possible that financial stability risks would not be um, significant, would may not be significant. The report also noted that there are notable risks from stable coins, which um, we have, uh, all of us globally have been focused on, trading platforms, and in the United States, a reliance on money service business licenses, which are state level money service transmitter licenses, often implemented for um, anti-money laundering types of uh, regulations, but do not generally take on safety and soundness issues. Uh, within the crypto system, there are all kinds of vulnerabilities that lead to systemic risk. Uh, vulnerabilities are significant, but again, I do not think they are unique to the crypto system. We saw speculative driven asset prices. There was run risk. There is leverage. There is interconnectedness and there are operational vulnerabilities. To me, that sounds very much like the set of vulnerabilities we see in the traditional financial system and which many of our countries use to monitor for financial stability risks. The specific identified regulatory gaps that we highlighted was one, a spot market for crypto assets that are not securities. Um, second, the potential and um, Take, taking advantage of regulatory arbitrage, domestic and cross-border, and then third, direct access, direct retail access to markets, not through broker dealers or futures commission merchants. You turn to the next slide, please. So as the crypto events of the past year unfolded, um, in some ways, I think we were Partly, we were lucky in some sense and may not be so lucky next time. It was clear the risk to investors and consumers surfaced um, and that we need better transparency and consumer understanding of these products and risks. Just as a few examples, the SEC and CFTC have brought more than 146 enforcement cases. The state security regulators have brought 480 investigations and 145 enforcement actions. The CFPB, our Consumer Protection Bureau, had over 8,000 complaints between 2018 and 2022. Um, and of course, governance in crypto assets is weak. Instability was mainly within the crypto sector. Broader systemic risks were largely absent. Going back to what I said on the previous slide, probably because of limited scale, probably because of limited interconnections with the traditional financial sector. And, and just also at this point, 
fairly limited use for money and payments. Um, next slide, please. So um, just to highlight a few of the explicit recommendations that FSOC made, um, again, just focus thing on the lead sort of same risk, same activity, same regulatory outcome, um, not unique to the underlying technology if it's providing the same type of financial service and providing the same type of risk to um, consumers, investors, and to the broader economy. Um, certainly need to enforce existing regulations, securities and commodities rules, and banking rules. In terms of legislation, um, as I mentioned, create a spot market framework. These are for crypto assets that are not securities. Currently, it's basically enforcement, and one could you know, create regulations that are geared towards market integrity, a more preemptive ex-ante approach. Second, regulate stable coins for run risks, the operational risks, and um, not on the slide, concentration. Uh, stable coins have the potential to scale up very quickly. Those are all key. Those, again, those risks are very common to uh, financial services. Uh, third, regulate platforms that provide multiple services. Um, I think all of us know about these platforms or become much more familiar with some of these platforms. Supervisors, regulators do not have visibility into the various affiliates. This is domestic and onshore and offshore. Um, there are uh, uncertainties about exchanges and the role of custody, whether you can, uh, what the rules relate to segregation of assets. And also you need to increase coordination among the agencies. These platforms combine trading, lending, borrowing, a number of activities. They are not just exchanges. And then finally, let me just say, uh, there are, we asked for a study of the potential systemic risks of direct retail access to crypto assets. For example, there are some vertical integration services provided by broker dealers, retailers. Retail uh, customers can go directly to these services without the benefits of broker dealers or FCMs. Um, so I think to conclude, I would just, um, uh, repeat, we believe crypto assets, digital assets more broadly, are potentially transformational with many benefits for the economy and efficiencies, but there are very clear risks that we need to address, some of which could become systemic. Um, we need to enforce consumer and investor protection laws. We need to uh, establish legislation for uh, the gaps that exist, of which there are many, um, and we need to promote glo global cross-border cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nelly Lang, uh, for giving us the, this very important uh, U.S. Uh, perspective. Uh, and uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, bring also Andrea Meckler into the conversation. Andrea is member of the governing board at the Swiss National Bank. Andrea. The Floor is yours. Thank you so much, Cecilia. It's a great pleasure for me to be on this panel, and particularly after these really very interesting presentation on which I will try to build with a quite different perspective in the sense that as a central bank, we've always had to strike the balance between, of course, safeguarding stability for the system, but also embracing innovation. I'm not going to go as far as embracing disruption as Michael did, but we do try, and I believe we have a responsibility to, to embrace and understand innovation. So my focus today is going to be on the rise of digital asset markets, in particular the rise of DLT-based FMIs, uh, distributed ledger technology-based uh, financial market in infrastructure, and the role of central bank in mitigating some of the risk, and particularly I want to focus on one risk. On one risk is to settlement settlement risk or the risk in the payment landscape. 
So to discuss what may happen in the future, and we've seen there's a lot happening, and we, we do believe there, there is going to be quite a lot, it's important to look at, to have a step back and look at the today's system, just super stylistically. What, how does today's system look like? Today, we have what is called a two-tier financial system, the central bank in the middle. I know, I'm sorry for the regulator, it's a very simple system. The, the central bank in the middle that provides liquidity to financial institution, uh, and also very importantly, access to the central bank balance sheet for central bank money. And the, the financial institutions are the ones that deal with the retail sector. So everything that has to do with the retail payment is in that blue sphere. And this is not where my focus is going to be. My focus is going to be how do you maintain that core system in the blue sphere here, which let's face it, in the domestic sphere, if you think of payments and this interbank or wholesale payment has worked beautifully. It's really been very little settlement risk in the traditional world and the conventional world. And why is that? That is basically because e-technology, actually in the 80s, that was introduced in the 80s, uh, so almost 40 years ago, uh, has really allowed central banks to manage a very important risk, which is the settlement risk. And what is this technology? That is the um, RTGS, the real-time growth settlement system, which are often mandated by the cent central bank. Why it, and it wasn't, the, and this is a point I believe that Nelly made beautifully. It's not the technology that solved the problem, but the technology allowed to, um, to capture principles to address principles that are needed to mitigate risk. In this case, it was very simple. What does the RTGS system, all, all countries have an RTGS system in the core, in the middle, and it does basically three things. It allows large payments, important payments, the systemic part where the systemic risk is to be on one hand final, irrevocable, and in central bank money. And the question I'm asking today is, now that we're, we're having, and we've seen in the pre previous presentation, a new technology, DLT-based uh, infrastructures, how do you, deal, do you think about these, I'm gonna call them old principle, I should call them conventional principles. Do you keep them in the new technology? Do you need to address them? What does it mean? And I'm just gonna give you three examples to run you through it. Could you please go to the next slide? So the reality is in Switzerland, we do have the emergence of a tokenized asset ecosystem. It's still at the beginning, but we do have one because it is supported by a sound and legal regulatory framework. In 2021, a DLT Act came into force that allows to have a legal basis for trading uh, of rights through electronic register, i.e. DLT based. So now we have a first regulated stock exchange that allows the trading and settlement of digital assets. Now I'm not gonna go into whether this is more efficient, whether it's better. I'm gonna take the assumption that we are in a world, suddenly I'm gonna move forward, I agree, that a systemic, that, that you do have, you live in a world where there is a systemic flow of transaction taking place on such a DLT infrastructure. And then the question is, how do you make it safe and secure? And that's where we've done uh, a project together with the BIS Innovation Hub. Uh, it's called the Project Elvitia to exactly look at that. And, and, and doing it very simply, we've done three things. One, we've done, do we need to just use the old system, i.e. create a simple link to the old or conventional RTGS system? It works. It works beautifully, but of course, you don't get the synergies of using the new technologies. Or do you use a, a coin, a, a wholesale CBDC? Do you need central bank money on that uh, uh, infrastructure? You can also use private coin. I'm gonna focus on the wholesale CBDC. We came to the conclusion that if you're gonna have a, a systemic flow of transaction on a platform like this, you will need this to apply the same principle as you did before. And that principle is to have central bank money in digital form, i.e. a wholesale CBDC that is available on such a platform. Now, this is one thing we've done. Now, it, we did two more things. One is what does it mean for cross-border? As we know, domestically, you could argue it works quite well. Cross-border, quite a lot of questions. And so we've done another project. Can you please go to the next slide? 
And there we basically used one platform, the platform we have in Switzerland, and we have seen, can you do, a, can you process a cross-border transaction using wholesale CBDC. We did this with the Banque de France. They issue a, a, a Euro wholesale CBDC. We issued a, a Swiss franc CBDC, and we did it on this shared platform. Again, I want to say something very important. In the end, the key takeaway for us was not about technology. The technology works. I'm not going whether it's scalable, but it works. It works very nicely. But the question for us was the governance. Right? The question is, how do central banks make sure they can con keep control of their, of their uh, central bank money? And we used here a, a particular uh, a design, a dual notary signing me mechanism. It works. But also you had also another old, old question, who has access to one of those platforms? So often the questions are the same, but the question, the, then we have to figure out what does it mean in this new system? And we've gone one, one more step, again, with the BIS Innovation Hub, um, and this is a project that is not yet finished. We're, we're just uh, in the midst of doing it. It's called the Project Mar Mariana. Can you please go to the next slide? And it's basically uh, asking a similar question, but going one step forward. If you live in a DLT ecosystem, again, I'm making the assumption, the assumption we're moving in that direction. Um, can you use really DeFi protocols to not just to actually create markets, digital asset markets to trade and send, settle safely on using this new technology. And what does it mean for our conventional principle that we have to maintain safety? So what we're doing here is we're doing it actually Banque de France, uh, Swiss National Bank, but also um, Monetary Authority of Singapore, just three, we could have more. And each central bank issues its own wholesale CBDC. Again, the idea is if this is going to be systemic, you need a wholesale CBDC. You need the, the dependent of what we have central bank money uh, for settlement. And the idea is each uh, creates a, a, um, issues it. We have a bridge to some neutral network where we create this big liquidity pool and you can settle basically FX transaction. And the last slide, please, using that setup, we're exploring even one more thing is can you do trading, i.e. can you use DLT platform to actually determine the prices of uh, FX trades? Again, we're not saying this is the right way because you know central banks are not going to be into market being a market maker, but it is about understanding what can be new about technology and understanding what are the mechanism or the principles. I'm going to call them old principle. I should really call them more time-tested principle to maintain basic trust and stability in the system and to understand which of those you need to keep conceptually. Do you just re duplicate them, recreate them in the new system, or at what point do you need to think about something different, but that has the same purpose to maintain security? I'm, I'm going to stop it here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, for uh, um, that fascinating presentation of some of the things that we are working together in and, and uh, across um, the BIS Innovation Hub and with uh, Swiss National Bank as an important partner. Uh, so I think we have opened up uh, a quite a nice um, set of, of uh, important th questions and um, it might feel daunting sometimes <laughs> what, everything that is going on uh, in the industry, uh, in the uh, central banking community and also on the regulatory side. So I'd like to uh, raise two questions since this is the European Systemic Risk Board um, involved obviously in system, systemic risk. Uh, assessment and mitigation and um, using macroprudential uh, tools as, as one very important feature. So I'll have one question about the governance in this uh, future we're going into and one about the contents of policy. But starting with governance, we, we, it's obviously clear that many of the things we're discussing here um, are crypto assets, stable coins, DeFi, uh, they move uh, cross-border, which means that the public sector response also had to be a solutions needs to be cross-border. 
Um, do you think we have the appropriate frameworks to cooperate at an, an international level to achieve uh, efficient frameworks for, for risk identification, monitoring, regulation, avoiding regulatory arbitrage and the likes? Uh, or do you think there is uh, more to do uh, in the uh, cooperation in the international space? Uh, so that's my first question and I hope if anyone would like to take a shot at this, you can either raise your hand or just take the word and the floor is yours. I'll, st I'll start. Okay, yes, I'll, I'll give a start. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, it's, it's, as you highlighted, it's critical that supervisors and regulators have insight into have some visibility into all the different affiliates and of which some are overseas, for example, the Bahamas um, or and the US. And um, and that's critical. This is again not a new situation. This has happened in the past where um, banks, foreign banks set up, you know, and you don't have visibility into it. It created a new regime um, for foreign bank operations in other countries. Um, so clearly international cooperation, coordination is important. The Basel Capital Framework came together when needed, um, set global minimum standards. That's an example. IOSCO sets uh, principles. I think um, the actual mechanism by which to achieve coordination, I think, is open for discussion. But there are examples in the past of how one can take that step, you know, uh, through FSB, through G20, through broader, as has been discussed recently, maybe beyond G20 for for crypto. Um, um, I would just. I guess it would start there. And then money and payments is a whole nother issue than the crypto because money and payments as you and Andrea have discussed are some more fundamental. Um, we want to get into systemic risk. That is clearly the, the place and, and that, you know, needs even stronger mechanisms for coordination, but just a few thoughts as well. No, I, I share that uh, observation I, in the way I think about it is we, we stand on the shoulders of our predecessors. Uh, they learned uh, hard earned lessons and uh, uh, and we are doing the same. Um, anyone else would like to discuss whether we have the appropriate forms of forums for international collaboration? Okay, I'll so just add, I, I, I think I, we do. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, no, from no, our perspective, I, I, I do think we have the right frameworks in place. And Nelly gave some examples of work that's happening. I spoke to a few things. I think as a starting point, we should leverage existing standard setting bodies, CPMI, ASCO, and the principles they have. Um, I know in the US that the SEC and CFTC are looking to apply existing regulations to activity. So I think before we consider what has to change, we should leverage existing rules and principles that are in place. But I think the framework is there. Xavier? Yeah, no, I, I agree with both uh, what uh, Michael and Nelly said. Uh, just two, uh, for me, are questions more than, uh, more than anything mm -hmm. else. Um, in this area, um, I think still we do not know very well how do we have to regulate domestically, right? So the the cross border issue for me already, you know, it's a, it's a, a further step which is difficult. But uh, frankly, uh, uh, we we need more clarity of what we want. You know, I I understand that I am typically of the principle that not keep changing the regulations with things that happen, no? So the, just to profit from the institutions or from the relations we have, I think it's the same that you've said. But, uh, but uh, okay, I, we should advance more in the clarity of what we want. Uh, because what I see, and in particular with the FTX episode and, and, and this episode that also that Nelly mentioned in the, in the report, um, my impression uh, is that, um, after these things happen, consumers want to be insured and want to be 
basically made full of the money they've lost. And then we are in trouble, right? Because this is clearly a moral hazard problem. And so we have to think very carefully on how are we going to regulate not to induce uh, no, a further wave of claims that then the public, no, the public sector feels compelled to, no, to, to attend. So, so that's one point. And the second, and this is on the cross border, I, I see an obstacle, uh, uh, which is kind of, I think, an elephant in the room, which is the, the geopolitical tensions that we have, no, the sanctions, the tension between the US and China, um, that all these may, you know, uh, push us towards decoupling of systems. So how do we do that? You no, know? all these that we want to do and to be efficient when maybe the systems may be decoupling again. I don't know. Okay, and Andrea? Just very quickly, um, I liked um, the points also, uh, what Xavier said. I mean, you need to leverage what exists. And it's not only cross-border. I think it's also border cross-border sometimes uh, get changed. Ultimately, I see one of the big challenges is interoperability. A lot of it has to do with access. How do you mix digital into the traditional world? And it's not just technical. It's also about fungibility of, of, of money that ultimately comes there. And it's also about access. Who gets to access what? So, and this is one of the oldest questions and whether it's, it's true on the domestic side and it's true on the cross-border side. But I think I must say on this question, Cecilia, I thought it was really helpful to have some of these projects that I've shown and others, the, the BIS Innovation Hub, that allows exactly to do some cross-border project in areas that otherwise would have been really difficult. Like we would not have been able to go into that depth, but to really see what happens. And I think this kind of a forum is can be really very helpful. Thank you. Uh, so that was uh, some issues around the governance for, for um, handling all these um, innovations on the private sector, but also as we heard, some, a lot of things going on with the public as well. Um, let me go into more of the contents, and I'm, I'm particularly interested since we have participators coming from macroprudential authorities across Europe, um, and when they are sort of dealing with new sources for uh, new sources of systemic risks that that could emerge in the regulated financial system, what are your sort of best advice to them? What and what sort of granularity do they have to? go into? Will, will future supervisors have to start learning to supervise smart contracts, to, to figure out automated market makers and the likes, or do they need to stop somewhere else? And, and um, uh, what would the future supervisor actually look like, you think? Great question. <laughs> I am not a supervisor. <laughs> Xavier, you, 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 you teach the future supervisors. What, what, what career advice do you give them? Well, uh, well, first to be tech savvy. So this definitely I would uh, give the advice today, no, to, to be on top of, uh, I mean, general advice, no, but to be on top of technological developments to, under, to try to understand. And, 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 and in fact, in particular, uh, as we know, no, the crypto world is quite difficult to understand. So uh, at least if you are not a native in this world, right? Uh, so, so definitely, this I, I would say that this is uh, the, the the thing I I I, uh, I would say, yeah? um, because it, I, I think it's very difficult to uh, to understand the consequences of some of the new technologies. And I think this has happened with all technologies. No, I think it happened with the railways. <laughs> so, which now it looks okay. So how it could happen? Well, it happened with the railways. No? So it, it also happens you now with, uh, with these technologies. And then, for example, certain algorithms introduce certain biases. Well, fine, but it, this is very difficult to, you know, to find out. You, have a, you need a lot of study, a, a lot of understanding on, on, on how and why it happens, but uh, at the end of the day, it's also to have a good team, good advice, but uh, and personally to be on top of it. I might just add from our perspective, I think there's it's a combination of two things. It's one, 
yes, the technology that is coming out is clearly sophisticated, new, and all of that, and that requires everyone to to learn more. Um, for example, I understand the SEC is increasing the size of its crypto asset and cyber unit. Uh, the CFTC is standing up an office of technology. So I think those are all prudent and necessary actions. But at the same time, someone mentioned earlier, I think that the same risk, I think is a term that was used. Ultimately, the risk we're talking about manifest themselves in the same way as other risk, liquidity risk, operational risk. So if you apply existing time-tested principles to these new activities, I think you can still leverage those existing skills and regulations, you know, to reinvent the wheel completely. So it's a combination of both, I think. I may add something. The, uh, I think it also has come up before, but I think it's important to understand that the this financial crisis is like now again the FTX case, which was no, uh, a, which is a case in point, has all the ingredients of the classical financial crisis. Yes. Oh, yes. It's a bubble, excessive leverage, excessive risk taking. Lack, lack of controls, potential fraud. It has everything. So it has reminded me, for example, of some instances of the savings and loans crisis of what happened, which is a very different case, right? But but um, I mean, the, the futures are similar. So this means that I guess, apart from being uh, on top of the technical developments, no, one has to understand very well, no, if you want the, the the basic principles on on financial crisis, no, and and then put them together, no. I mean, yeah, I will. Uh, just very quickly, I think absolutely, it's very important to differentiate the problems that are related to governance, poor governance, and governance mechanism that are ultimately extremely important. But then I do think we should not underestimate that new technologies has the potential to change the structure of the markets. And this is something that needs to be understood. I think it came out very nicely, Xavier, in what you showed and, and, and what's happening in the US Treasury market. We've done some work in the FX market. And those are things that require ultimately, whether we want it or not, more granularity, new data, or even new data architecture. It needs new skills. It needs new interconnection to understand the things. So I think it's both sides, but we shouldn't just because there are when the governance doesn't work, we know it's going to crash to underestimate how technology may also change more fundamentally things. No, so, I think, yes, Nelly. I just, yeah. Um, so one of my points I tried to make earlier, I do think the sources of systemic risk are still pretty common to most financial activities. The excess leverage, the mismatches in funding or currency or something, the interconnections, the complexity, and then you have fraud and all that kind of thing. Those are common to most issues. Technology does add some complexity to the whole thing. So there's somewhere in here, Cecilia, where we're between where we, what we know and how we adapt. And we're adapting from banking system, from credit systems that are dominated by banking to non-banks. I mean, that's just an example. Like, we had to learn securitization and and you know private funds and all that. It this is not on that same order. Um, this is newer. This is more technical, but it's again financial activities to the extent they're used to provide financial services. There are probably common, common um, sources of vulnerabilities that can lead to systemic risk. If I may uh, chip in an observation myself also, in the same sense as um, um, there were corporate casualties in the sort of the younger age of the market economy and we got an extensive financial auditing uh, as a result, accounting and auditing, which in my view is um, the kind of private sector look, looking after itself uh, because we, we can't have all the you know supervisors looking into all the auditing of all the all the co co corporations in the world I, I uh, my sort of speculation here is that we will see uh, uh, more elements of technological auditing um, in the in the space of machine learning uh, uh, artificial intelligence. <laughs> 
uh, and the likes, because at the end of the day, it's really in the interest of the private sector to um, to have a, 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 a playing field that is not uh, regulated in details. Um, I have allowing uh, uh, for one uh, question from the audience, which uh, is actually uh, very, I think it was really interesting, so I'm going to uh, quickly bring it to the table. Um, we know that the digital society creates a lot of large data sets, opening up information that can be helpful in monitoring, signaling, risk in early stage. Um, if you would uh, give the ESRB some advice, what is the first thing uh, they should try to look at in order to kind of share more data uh, across border, across sectors? Um, to um, get get a better feel for for what is happening. Is there any um, advancements in in this area? Someone would like to point to. Sharing and processing large data sets. Well, the only thing I can, well, the first thing is just for research is good to have access no, to <laughs> I mean, what I'm going to say. No, uh, it, it's good to have access to to those uh, large data sets, maybe sometimes anonymized, no, obviously properly so that there is no undue disclosure. Uh, but uh, at least for uh, for research purposes, um, I think central banks have advanced uh, in this respect. That's my impression that they are, they have opened more you know, the research database, uh, which were very detailed, for example, loans and things like this, uh, to do excellent research. And, 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 and we have learned uh, quite a bit. You know? So at least in this respect, I think we have to follow, uh, we have to follow this line. I, couple comments. Um, I think a little here, I'm not sure the, the, what the question for sharing is what we're after. Certainly for illicit finance risks in, in the use of crypto assets, there are arrangements across countries to share when necessary um, to help identify, you know, bad actors and prevent um, that. So I think those kinds of arrangements are in place. Um, you know, the whole crypto asset space raises all kinds of questions about privacy and user protections and that. And I do think the, the community, the globally, is still struggling with how to provide privacy and protections while ensuring um, national, national security and prevention of those are issues that come up whenever we're talking about the future of money and payments. Um, I'm sure that so that's an area. Um, and then one a little bit unrelated, but came up with Javier's discussions today about um, treasury markets. Uh, we do. There's an area where transparency in the U.S. treasury markets has been a little slow in coming, and um, currently you can see weekly aggregate trading volumes, um, prices are available instantaneous. You know, prices are always available, but trading is not. We are now moving to, in the first quarter, to daily transactions, but have been also processing where we will be providing, assessing how to provide transaction level data. Um, which can allow for you know greater um, access, other more people to have more access to the data that can help with market making. So I think in general, just agreeing with broad data availability is useful. Um, the sharing is a little bit what purpose we're we're trying to create. You know, the question that came in from the audience, I think, is we could answer in a number of different ways, but um, data availability is usually can be helpful for most cases. Um, but you have to trade off privacy. True. OK, True. Uh, our time is up uh, and I'm not going to even try to um, uh, make a summary out of this very rich discussion. I certainly learned a lot. I hope it's been equally helpful for uh, all the participators at this very well organized conference. Uh, I'd like to thank Xavier Nelly 
Andrea and, and Michael for, for really generous contributions. And I would like to say uh, thank you from my behalf uh, in Basel and hand the floor back to uh, Connie uh, and the organizers. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank thank you, you Cecilia. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kingsley, and thanks to the panel members for this thoughtful discussion. It was very interesting.